<laughs> Welcome back to the Runaround. I'm your co-host Greg Jubb alongside Brad Jager here in the booth and we still have Champ Page with us and we have a question from Dennis of Temple Hills. Dennis, you're on the Runaround. Uh, how are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jeter. Dennis, thanks for joining us. Always good to have support, Champ, right? Thanks yeah, for listening. Great. And right now we have Dr. Felton in the booth with us. He is a doctor of podiatric medicine and surgery and is a USA licensed cyclist and triathlete. Dr. Felton, thanks for joining us on the runaround. You have quite an impressive resume in the sports and medical fields. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, having me here. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I've uh, been around sports all my life, both as a participant um, and as a doctor, as well as a coach. Uh, uh, basically, from the collegiate level, when I was attending college, I was exposed to the sports medicine field as a student athletic trainer at Millersville University of Pennsylvania. Uh, as I progressed through podiatry school, I still stayed involved in sports medicine, and that's actually why I went into podiatry. I was uh, fascinated by the uh, complexities of the functioning of the feet, and when I chose podiatry as a career, I decided to pursue the study of the function of the feet known as biomechanics. Mm -hmm. So tell us, we're dealing with runners now. Uh, what are some common things that runners uh, lack in naturally, or just you know, common, some common biomechanical mistakes that they make? Well, the one fortunate thing I have about practicing podiatric sports medicine and dealing with runners is that I have a very captive as well as preemptively educated audience of patients who come through my door. Uh, most of these patients have already addressed what I like to call the extrinsic factors contributing that can possibly contribute to their problems, i.e. the types of shoes they wear, their training services, how they decide to put together a training program and ramp up their activity where I come in is identifying essentially what they were given naturally and unfortunately many of us are not genetically blessed with a perfectly functioning biomechanical foot mm -hmm. and that is where the computerized gait analysis comes in. Right, gait analysis, that's a term you hear a lot in running. Yes. Uh, you're a specialist in it. Uh, tell us a little about what that really entails. Uh, the computerized gait analysis actually has been around for a number of decades. Of course, as the technology has improved, the uh, equipment has improved as well as the software that goes along with it. A computerized gait analysis involves a pressure mat that has 900 pressure sensors per square centimeter. It comes with its own proprietary software, and what we're able to do is have a patient ambulate, i.e. walk over this, and what it captures is actually, as the foot is in contact with the ground, how the weight-bearing pressures are distributed and how the patient's center of gravity travels from the foot, from the heel, through the um, arch and ball of the foot as a patient takes a step. And that gives us a mountain of information with regards to unlocking where the actual cause of their physical overload and pain is coming from. What do you find is the main problem uh, from somebody having a, a deficiency in their stride or their in their patterns? I would say as far as the diagnoses that I make, number one has to be plantar fasciitis, which is an overstrain of a fibrous band of tissue on the bottom of the foot that is actually the divider between the layers of muscles in the bottom of the foot and what's called the subcutaneous fat pad that we all have. What ends up happening is if a patient is ambulating and they have a foot type that is not neutral, i.e. when the foot is in full contact with the ground, it's not lined up completely perpendicular with the ground itself, you end up overstraining those collagen fibers, and those fibers can only be overstrained so far before you start to get small micro tears and a resultant inflammatory process. So how is that corrected? Essentially, when we identify how far away from neutral they are, we like to utilize as a primary treatment uh, prescription orthotics made from the gait scan itself, combined with appropriate stretching activities. Sometimes we'll, we will uh, 
We will also prescribe physical therapy modalities such as ultrasound, e-stim treatments, which are the same types of treatments that you have your professional athletes receiving from their trainers in the training rooms. Um, also modifying their activity levels and ensuring that when we are biomechanically supporting them with a prescription orthotic, that we are making sure that they're well educated about what types of shoe gear that can be utilized in order to complement the support from the orthotic. Now, as a distance runner, I'm used to having some gait analysis and having orthotics. Now, how about somebody like Champ, who's a sprinter, um, who needs less weight in their in their shoes? I mean, can this help somebody with like a sprinter? It absolutely can. In fact, I recently saw one of my patients back for follow-up who actually is a sprinter. He does cross country, and but then he also participates as a sprinter in track. And the great thing about the computerized gait analysis is because you have such precise and accurate information, you can make a very small low profile orthotic. For my sprinters, the orthotic is actually two millimeters thick. You can hold this in your hand and it literally feels like it weighs nothing. Mm -hmm. So it does not impede someone's ability to wear a track flat. So in your experience, now for distance runners, you commonly see uh, what are known as overuse injuries, stress fractures, things like that. Uh, how did, what do you see in terms of your experience, uh, the disparity between the injuries that distance runners get and what sprinters get, you know, the, um, the whole scope of track and field athletes? Interestingly enough, I, we, you mentioned that term overuse. We are actually in the profession getting away from that because what we're realizing is that it's not overuse. These pe you, have one, you have a group of individuals, so let's say 10 individuals, Every one of them are going through the same exact training regimen and program. Why do some of them get this pro get these quote unquote overuse problems? Some don't. It's because of the biomechanics. We are getting more into what's calling being called the over disuse syndrome, meaning that the patient is not overusing it, unbeknownst to them, because of their biomechanics, they are actually overstraining those tissues. Uh, in my sprinters, I do tend to see that if there are some of these underlying biomechanical problems the onset of them seems to be a little bit more short-term acute. For example, you can have a long-distance runner who is gradually overstraining their plantar fascia and will develop a particular set of symptoms more in a more gradual manner, whereas if you're overstraining the plantar fascia in someone who's a sprinter, sometimes one step and then all of a sudden they actually overstrain that or even partially tear it. Right, and is there one injury that's more dangerous? Because I know acute, you can kind of associate sharp pain, you know, usually something that results in cramp, something that's on the spot, there's so much strain involved in, in sprinting. Uh, is that necessarily worse than an over, a stress fracture, something that's accumulated over miles and miles of training? Is there ever... It, it's actually indigenous to the particular individual level of activity. Because again, with a, with a stress fracture, again, where stress fractures come from, I just, told, I just uh, had spoke about the biomechanics and how you overstrain an area. That's actually the truth about the stress fracture. Most of my patients come in who've developed stress fractures. They've been going through the same training regimen their entire life. None of the medical comorbidities are there, such as osteopenia or, or any types of metabolic deficiencies. But when we perform a gait analysis on them after we heal the stress fracture, we realize that they've been straining and stressing this area again and again and again. So each group of runners, you have to take what they're doing and how that's indigenous to the overall risk. How about older runners versus younger runners? I, I know older runners, as you get older, your your feet tend to widen out just because your body starts to fall apart. Accumulation of mileage. Right. And do you do you approach it a little bit differently with somebody as, a, say, 55 years old and about 220 pounds that's trying to run again? And that's the great thing about the gait analysis, along with my evaluation, is that we're able to utilize a variety of designs of orthotics based on a patient's uh, physical makeup. So yes, you do have to take a, a few different approaches and I'm also not afraid to speak with them about